Yes. Back in January, do you remember January? It was a long time ago. Back in January, George sat in my office and for hours he signed each one of these individually for you. So you'll have a signed copy to take home. this work? Yeah. And when I sign, because I have the world's worst signature, I actually draw a picture. So everybody gets a picture of Aries looking all cool and tough. <laughs> all right. So thank you guys for coming to the Cambridge Public Library. Thank you, George, for coming to the Cambridge Public Library. I'm going to let him take it away. Hi, everybody. Everybody can hear me okay, right? Yeah. Awesome. Everybody can see this big picture of my head exploding, right? Yeah. Why would I have drawn such a thing? Because yeah. Because uh, Tina makes her kids lose their mind. <laughs> wait, did you guys hear that? <laughs> oh, wait, I love that. Okay, this is great. There's, always, there's a few right answers to this. That was the mythological one. This, this is a reference to the birth of Athena. This is, uh, Athena was born from the head of Zeus, fully formed in armor, jumping out. And you can see there's Athena, her, Athena herself right in the middle. I didn't want to make people think I thought I was Zeus, because that's a good way to get hit by a lightning bolt. So I drew Zeus himself. I also drew Hermes. I drew the Hydra. Why else would I have drawn this, though? Yeah, sir. Because it's to show the ideas, right? That's the optimistic idea. It's also like my head is so full of all these ideas that they're just bursting forth. And I just have these things leaping out of my skull. Now, that with the mythological reason, we have the, uh, the optimistic reason. What's the other reason? Yeah. <laughs> Did you guys hear that? Humor. I like it. OK, it kind of is. We'll go with that one. So basically, I, I'm going to ask you guys a question. Who here likes to draw? Hands up, please. Nice. Nice, okay. Who here likes to write? Hands up, please. Yeah. Eh, there's always a few is. Like, all right, let me tell you guys about myself. I love to write, I love to draw. It's my two favorite things to do in the world. But I gotta say, of the two of them, drawing is a little bit easier for me. And so this was a picture I drew one day. I went into my studio in Brooklyn. And have you guys ever had that sort of day when you're just like, like, it's so hard to put words together. And like, you're dragging them out of your skull, but like, every word is like holding onto your brain with its fingernails. It's so hard. Have you guys ever had that experience? Yeah. Yeah. That was me this day. I was supposed to be writing, and I just couldn't do it. I'm like, oh, this is so terrible. So finally, I just quit, and I drew a picture of my head exploding. Because I did wish that the ideas could just burst out like that. Like, it'd be so awesome just to sit down, like, well, got to write a book today. And also, boom, the book just pops out. But then I'd probably have to go to the hospital. <laughs> So, can you guys see this okay? <laughs> do we have any third graders in the house? No. Do we have any people who used to be third graders in the house? I just want to point out, like, no teacher put their hand up. <laughs> so, this is a picture of me in third grade. I was already mentioned, like, my favorite things to do in the world are to write and to draw, right? In third grade, my favorite things to write and draw, well, more to draw. I love to draw monsters, because, like, drawing monsters is awesome, right? I love to, like, draw a muscle man, because the monster's got to eat something. And I love to draw pretty ladies. And I would always sit in the back of class drawing these things. And, you know, I got okay grades, but they could have been better. Like, my teacher's like, that's a really nice pretty lady eating a cyclops, but we're learning fractions, George. I'm like, okay. Third grade, and I used to tell this is fourth grade, but I only learned recently it was actually third grade. Third grade, I'm sitting there drawing like, I don't know, the Minotaur or something, and my teacher comes in and she's like, guess what class? We're spending the rest of the year studying Greek mythology. We're gonna be drawing muscle men fighting monsters. And like little third grade George is like, you're ripped off! It was like the moment I've been waiting for. I'm like, this is my chance to shine. Um, it changed my life forever. I mean, obviously I'm really into Greek mythology now still, um, I had to go, actually, it was very much like this. I had to go on a stage and deliver an oral report dressed as my favorite god. Who am I? Hermes. Hermes, yeah. So there was no cameras invented yet back then, so I had to recreate this in Photoshop. There's a few inaccuracies I want to go over. Check out the beard. I didn't actually grow the beard until fourth grade. <laughs> my winged cap was actually a baseball hat that had wings on it that we got somewhere. 
Uh, the caduceus, his wand, was made of green paper snakes and a coat hanger. I had this toy Pegasus that the wings popped out the side of, and I had a golden shoelace, and I was going to tie it onto my legs and make these awesome winged sandals, but I forgot the wings that day, so instead I cut really lame wings out of loose leaf paper and taped them to my pants. <laughs> and the part that's missing from this that was the real bit that tied it all together, I wore a towel. So I had to go up in front of everybody I knew on a stage like this, wearing a towel and all this stuff on me, and be like, Hermes was the greatest of the Greek gods because... Should have been humiliating, right? But for me, it was like the coolest thing ever. Like Hermes, still my favorite god. Like Greek myths became, like I became obsessed with them. I read every single book of the library I could find that was about the Greek myths that was age appropriate. And from there, I went to other mythologies like Norse mythology, Egyptian mythology, African mythology, Native American mythology, until I got up to like King Arthur and King Arthur was kind of boring, so I stopped. But, <laughs> sorry for King Arthur fans, but man. Um, but then, you know, that's many years later, so now, I grow up and I tell a series of uh, comics about the Greek gods. Now, this is going to be a test. I didn't ask, who here likes mythology? Hands up. All right. Now, I'm probably going to get pretty geeky here, but I want to know how geeky to get. So I'm going to point at one of those figures. Up. I'm going to point to the figures. You guys just yell out who it is, OK? So big guy right there. Zeus! He is holding hands with. See the way they are holding hands and also arm wrestling at the same time? Yeah. It's because they love each other, but they love to fight even more. <laughs> Tall, dark, and handsome in the corner. Hey. Yeah, which makes that his bride? Right. All right, and then <laughs> this one right here? Right here? Oh, you guys are very good. Okay, this dude right here sharpening a knife. His brother. Hephaestus. And Hephaestus' his wife. Hephaestus. Check this action out. How's this for awkward family dynamics? They're married. She's got her arm on his shoulder. She's like, oh, my husband. But she's making goo-goo eyes at Aries. <laughs> Very awkward. <laughs> Lady on fire. Yeah. Oh, you guys are good. All right, my main man right here. Hermes. And he's whispering a secret, too. Yeah. yeah, they're the two smartest gods in Olympus. I decided when I drew this picture that they're actually telling a joke about Zeus. He can overhear it, but he doesn't understand it because they're just smarter than him. <laughs> this one right here. All right, which makes us her twin brother. Apollo. Very good. The dude pouring himself a drink. You guys are really good. Everybody knows this guy. Poseidon. Poseidon. And then this is the tricky one. He. Well, I already heard it. He. Yeah, Hebe. He. Who here has heard of Hebe? Just curiosity, hands up. Only a few people, right? Now, this is interesting about Hebe. Hebe, her dad is Zeus. Her mom is Hera. She should be like the princess of Mount Olympus, right? Yeah. But Hebe is the goddess of youth, which means that even though she's like 5,000 years old, she's never allowed to grow up. So it kind of stinks. It's like me. Like when my family gets together for Thanksgiving, I come from this big Irish Catholic family. Even though I'm an old man, I still sit at the kids' table. And that like bums me out. And like for her, she's like at the kids' table of Mount Olympus. In fact, her job, see this jug? Her job is to serve drinks to all her half-brothers and half-sisters for all time. She's going to be the goddess of youth forever. She's like 5,000 years old. She's still like, would you like another drink, Apollo? Let's all like, put her head down and feel bad for Hebe for a second. Oh. <laughs> Poor Hebe. <laughs> Zeus! So this, uh, here's the thing about Olympians, right? Olympians is the series of write and draw. I maybe didn't say that yet. Olympians is going to be a 12-book series, although we only have seven volumes out right now. When I was putting the series together, this was the original cover sketch. This is me going to my publisher and being like, we're going to do 12 books. We're going to start with Zeus, and this is what the cover's going to look like. And they're like, no, it's not. Instead, we had something like this. Super hard to see, right? This is really washed out, but that's meant to be. This is the pencil drawing for Zeus. I throw this in here because, well, a lot of you guys like to draw, right? Who's ever had the experience where you see something in a book that like, you're like, I can never draw something that good, no way, no how. Put your hand up. Happens to me, too. So when I'm doing this, the first thing I do is I take a pencil sketch. I draw it really, really quick and really, really fast. This is like maybe like a 15-minute drawing, which like, you can't really see it because it's super light. Because then I'll actually go over it, and I ink it, and I color it. And then it looks pretty good, right? Yeah. You guys can tell me it looks pretty good. I won't mind. Yeah. All right, yeah, thanks, thanks. <laughs> yeah, now it's like this Zeus, he's holding a lightning bolt, and the lightning's coming out of his eyes, and there's a big Kronos in the background, and there's the Hecatonkeries and the Cyclopes. Yeah, it looks pretty sweet. Lightning is really fun to draw, by the way. I recommend everybody try it. 
So this is something called a dummy. Have you guys ever heard that expression in relation to books? So a dummy, this was me, it's, a, it's maybe about like five inches by seven inches. It's me drawing what the book is going to look like. I did it in pen and brush really quickly. So this is a shot from Zeus. There's the beginning, this is like the birth of the Titans and the Cyclopes and the Hecatonchires. And then this is what I showed to my publisher to sell them on the idea of a 12 book series. And then that's the finished. Not much different, right? It's pretty tight, it's colored. Here's another shot of it. This is Kronos the Titan. This is Zeus's dad grabbing the sickle of adamantine. He slices up and Uranus the sky. And then here's the finished version. It's like I basically added stars, right? This is a little bit disingenuous. Like this is me trying to impress my publisher with the 12 book series. Like nowadays I draw my dummies like on toilet paper with a burnt twig. Like I don't put any effort into it. Funny thing about that joke is sometimes people just stare at me and sometimes people laugh. I never know if that joke's gonna work. I'm glad it kinda did this time. All right, who here has ever seen either of the Clash of the Titans movies? What? You know the Clash of the Titans movies? There's the old one from the 80s and there was the one from a few years ago which is the worst movie ever made. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, or maybe you've seen Disney's Hercules. Yeah. Yeah. Or even the first of the Percy Jackson movies. All right, cool. I've seen all those movies too, and I like all those movies except for the new Clash of the Titans. But there's a weird thing in all those movies, in that in all those movies, Zeus is always this old guy with white hair and a beard, right? And we were talking a little bit about this earlier, but the thing about the gods, when you actually read the original myths, here's a couple things we learned about the gods. Most importantly, gods are immortal, right? Which means they never grow old and they never die, right? Wait, wait, I'm getting somewhere with you guys. Secondly, the gods change shape in like every story. They're super famous for that. So they can look like anything they want. They can look like you. They can look like you. They can look like me. They can look like Brad Pitt. They can look like a microphone. Whatever they want. They couldn't look like you. But so we have these gods who can look like anything they want and who never get old, right? And then third, and this part's a little silly. If you guys read any myths about Zeus, almost every single myth of Zeus is him chasing after a pretty lady, right? So you're this guy. You like nothing better than to chase after pretty ladies. You never get old and you can look like whoever you want. Would you be an old guy with white hair and a beard? Or would you be a 21 year old surfer dude from California? <laughs> so that's my Zeus. This is like cowabunga guys. All right, when I was making my dummy, I actually was a dummy. It was supposed to be 66 pages of comics and I left out two. So like a couple weeks before we were supposed to go to press, my editor's like, he calls me up and he's like, hey George, we're missing a couple pages from Zeus. I'm like, oh we are? He's like, yeah. I'm like, okay, I must have left them at my studio. I didn't actually draw them. So I ran to my studio and in like this panic, I drew and inked and colored this one and this one. Two pages of the Titans just going ape and ripping up the world. <laughs> they became my two favorite pages in that whole book. So I'd like to show this just to show A, it's good to make mistakes and B, just kind of show off because I like these pictures. <laughs> After Zeus, I knew that I was, I was doing one of the second book to be Athena, the gray-eyed goddess. I like this cover idea. It's kind of cool. It's just this intense shot of Athena staring out at us, right? But my publisher's like, let's make it look a little bit more like the Zeus cover. So we have this kind of style. So here she is herself, Athena, right in the middle. Here's the fates, the gigantes, and of course in the middle is the big gross head of Medusa. <laughs> This is the scene from the Athena book. We talked a little bit about before about how Athena was born from the head of Zeus. This is the moment from the book when she's actually born. I learned after drawing that picture of my own head exploding that it looks kind of silly to see that. So pretend Zeus's head is right here. Do you guys know the story of how she got in his head? Yeah. I'll like recount really quickly. So Zeus, and this is something we're going to turn to several times. Zeus is the worst husband who ever lived. He. Oh, totally. All right, so Zeus's first wife was this goddess named Metis. Metis was the goddess of, like, good advice. Her name, Metis, literally meant was the Greek word for, like, your conscience. So she helped him a lot during the war against the Titans and stuff, but there was a curse placed on her that her and Zeus, if they were to have a kid together, that child would grow up to overthrow Zeus as king of the gods. Zeus really digs being king of the gods. It's, like, the best job you could have. So he's like, I don't want that to happen. So rather than just like break up with her, he tricks her into turning into a fly and he eats her. <laughs> Which is like terrible, right? 
Now she's a goddess. She's immortal. She doesn't die. She just stays in his head. They change shapes too. So when he gets big, she gets a little bit bigger. You know, there's room. But what she doesn't realize, what Zeus doesn't realize rather, is that she was already pregnant with their daughter. And she gives birth inside of his head. And that's Athena. And for like 16 years, he has two goddesses living in his head. Just like going about life, Metis is teaching her, she makes her armor, all this stuff. But for 16 years, he has the worst pressure headache you can ever imagine. 16 years is longer than most of you guys have been alive. But when you're like a 5,000 year old god like Zeus, that pretty much is like an afternoon. But still, it gets so bad that finally one day he's like, I can't take it anymore. He goes to his son Hephaestus. He's like, Hephaestus, I have the worst pressure headache. You need to take a spike and crack my head open and release the pressure. Now Hephaestus has some serious daddy issues. He's like, yeah, I'll do this. <laughs> so Poseidon and Ares hold down with Zeus and he's struggling. And then Hephaestus takes a spike, puts it on his dad's head. Boom! That was not a good noise. <laughs> Boom! And then like, ah! This like 16 year old girl wearing armor comes jumping out of his skull and everyone's like, what happened? And like, look at Hera's face here. She's like, oh man, what did Zeus do now? Growing up inside of her dad's head, though, it really changed Athena. Instead of growing up to overthrow him, she actually becomes one of his like, closest allies. She's super duper smart. She's probably the smartest Olympian. She's like really wise, she's good at strategy. She's also the best warrior. Sorry, Ares fans. And as such, when the Gigantes attack Olympus, the Gigantes are these horrible, scaly gorilla monsters that are born during, uh, remember that shot of Areno slicing open the sky? Yeah. Remember the light pouring down? Yeah. It was actually Kronos slicing open Arenos. Everywhere that that light touched, it gave birth to a Gigante. So these horrible monsters that are jealous of the Olympians, they attack Olympus, and as, as the, the best warrior in Olympus, it falls to her to lead the attack. And sh she has to kill like the leader of the Gigantes. He is this, um, he's like big as a mountain, he's half goat and half gorilla, and he has a spell on him so that his skin can't be pierced while he's alive. So. Just to show how awesome she is, we start on her eyes. We zoom out, we zoom out, we zoom out. So she's this little tiny speck. And then you turn the page and you see how tiny she is to Pallas. Now remember, Pallas also, he can't be stabbed while he's alive. And she still kills him in like one page. Do you guys want to know how? Ow. All right, I love acting this bit out. So he's got the big club, right? He brings the club up. <laughs> Hits the ground. She runs up it like a bug. <laughs> Does his backflip off. He's like, Ugh. backflip, lands on his face. Boom, right through the eye with her spear. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. Because his eyes not his skin. Then, because he's dead, his skin can be cut. She takes her sword, she cuts a big chunk of his skin off, rips it off, makes a cape out of it. <laughs> Messed up, right? This is why, like, third grade, third grade George was like, I'm allowed to draw this, really? Like a lady stabbing a monster to death through the eye? It was pretty cool. All right, Hera, we've already seen her a little bit. Hera is my favorite goddess. A lot of people think that's strange. They're like, but Hera's so jealous of all of Zeus's girlfriends and she's so mean. I'm like, yeah, think about that. <laughs> so remember how I said Zeus could look like anything he wants? <laughs> See that little bird? That's Zeus. that's Zeus. So Zeus spent years trying to get Hera to marry him. But Hera's like, no, you're a total creep. You ate your first wife. I'm not going near you. <laughs> so he tried different ways. He like, you know, he shows her his six pack abs. He's like, what do you think? She's like, no. Nope. He like bench presses a mountain. What about that? She's like, no, nah, I'm not impressed. You eat your wife. <laughs> so finally he goes for the pity play. He, uh, one day, he creates this hurricane all around Mount Olympus. It goes on for days. Everyone's cooped up inside, just pouring rain. Even a goddess doesn't want to go outside in that. And then he transforms himself into a little tiny cuckoo bird. And he sits on Hera's windowsill and he's like, chirp, chirp, chirp. And she's like, oh. That creep Zeus, he's half drowned this poor little bird. And she picks the bird up and she puts it inside. And it's Kazam, hey baby, it's me, Zeus, marry me. <laughs> <laughs> and this time it finally works, she's finally been broken down. This panel right here on the top, that's her accepting his marriage proposal. <laughs> she grabs his beard and pulls him down. Oh, I'll marry you. But every time you screw up, you're going to pay. <laughs> now, that second panel, that's literally the first time Zeus has ever been afraid in his life. There's only one thing in all the cosmos Zeus is afraid of, and that is Hera. Does that stop him from screwing up all the time? No, he's not very smart. But still, this is that moment. 
So I love to show this bit because it's really, it's like a really pretty sequence, right? Like, like it's like the sunset and everyone's getting, like all, every, all creation's turned out to see the, the wedding of Hera and Zeus and it's all pink and pretty and she's getting her hair done. And they look at each other over the fire and he looks at her and he's like, you look beautiful. And she looks at him, she's like, I kill you, pig. And then they kiss and everything is so happy. And normally there's a few kids squirming in the audience, especially little boys at this point. So I'd like to follow this up with something really gross. Who's this guy in the top middle panel? Hercules. Hercules. That was his Roman name. The Greeks actually called him Heracles. And it's important to note the distinction because Heracles means the glory of Hera. His real name was Alcides. He is one of those, well, he, his dad is Zeus. His mom was a mortal princess named Alcmene. And Alcides means the son of Alcmede, so kind of a bad name. But basically, Hera makes him perform all these labors, these deeds, where he basically goes out and kills these monsters that are plaguing mankind in order to prove that he's worthy of coming to Mount Olympus. Oh, yeah. He's just killed his first monster. <clears throat> it's a creature called the Nemean lion. Have you guys ever heard of the Nemean lion? Yeah. Like a bulletproof lion. The only thing that could cut its skin was its own claw. So he choked it to death and then skinned it, wearing its skin as armor. Again, Greek mythology. It's like, what? <laughs> so now he's feeling pretty awesome. It's like, I just killed a bulletproof lion. I can't be stopped. He uh, gets his second job. He has to go into the swamps of Lerna and kill this poisonous snake that lives there. Any 10-year-olds in the house? Yeah. No. 10-year-olds, hands up. All right. Picture this, if you will. Your uncle goes to your parents. is like, hey, can I borrow your kid to go into the swamps to kill a giant poisonous snake? Like bad parents, right? And bad uncle. This is Aeolus. Aeolus is Heracles' 10-year-old nephew. He comes with him because, I don't know, just seems like a bad idea, I guess. They go walking through the swamp, and Heracles is like, yeah, I killed this Nemean lion. How bad can this poisonous snake be? And then he gets attacked, thrown against a tree. And then we see, oh, you know what? It's not so much a poisonous snake. Is this a giant poisonous dragon? And then the poisonous dragon's about to eat Aeolus, who's like, oh, my gods. And then Heracles rushes in, and then like, blam, blows his head apart. I want to point out, chunks of brain, teeth, big chunk of jaw. Totally gross, right? <laughs> And up on Mount Olympus, Zeus is like, well, that one was easy. And Hera's like, wait for it. Because then the stump of the dragon picks itself up. And there's this terrible wet ripping noise. like, And then it's like a two-headed poisonous dragon. And then that comes rushing at Heracles. Do you guys know what creature this is? The Hydra, yeah. He's like, batter up. <clears throat> now, here's the thing about Heracles, right? He's the greatest of the Greek heroes, but he's also possibly the dumbest. So he knows... He just knocked off one head and two more grow in its place. So what does he do? No smash, 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 grow, grow, grow. 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 Pause just for a second. You turn the page. <laughs> and he's made it much worse for himself. And because he's not very smart, he still keeps smashing heads. And like, thankfully, he brought along the 10-year-old. The oldest is like, uncle, hold on a second. Let me try burning the stump. And Aeolus touches the stump with the flame, and then there's this, like, the hydra screams. And then it burns, but oh, no new heads. And then Heracles is like, awesome, it's clobbering time. <laughs> and check this out. Up at Mount Olympus, Hera's, like, totally annoyed. She's like, he cheated. He didn't solve that one. That was the 10-year-old. This is a true thing, too. Originally, Heracles only has to do 10 labors, but because he cheats in this labor and, like, one other, he has to do 12. Isn't that cool? I think that's funny. He has to redo this one. Yeah. So that's like smash, 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 burn, 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 smash, smash, burn, burn, burn. And that's how he defeats the Hydra. This was my original cover for Hades. Why would I call him the wealthy one? Yeah, basically, like, I wanted to call it the wealthy one. We didn't end up going with this. But, like, Hades was the god of the dead, right? But he's also the god of, like, jewels because they believe that the dead went underground when they died. That's where the underworld was, right? That's why they call it the underworld. But that's also where gold comes from. That's also where diamonds come from, jewels come from, dollar bills. Everything comes from underground, right? No one's going to call me in the dollar bills thing? <laughs> so in all those movies I mentioned before, too, Hades is a bad guy, right? Nah, he's not, though. We, we always think of him as like the devil. But if you read the old myths, he's actually pretty close to Zeus. Like, they're much closer than, say, Zeus and Poseidon. Poseidon tries to overthrow Zeus. Hades and Zeus are kind of good buddies. <laughs> Hades is more of a depressed god. He hangs around underground with dead people all day, so, you know, he's a little emo. Here's the final cover. There's Hades himself. 
That's his future bride, Persephone. That's his mother-in-law, Demeter. And there's his three-headed guard dog, Cerberus. Demeter is my favorite thing to draw. Look how crazy she looks there. This is a sketch I did of Hades wearing his helmet of invisibility. This is important to note because Hades, you know like the way like Zeus had his lightning bolt and Poseidon had his trident? Hades was given a helmet that makes him invisible even to other gods, which is a pretty cool power. I don't know why we can see him in this picture. I guess I cheated a little bit. So, here's the way the story starts. Before she was Persephone, when she was a young girl, Persephone was called Cora. That's her right there. And Cora is a name that actually means young girl, so that's kind of like the worst name ever. But Cora is the daughter of Zeus and Demeter. And basically, Hades, underground all day, surrounded by dead people, kind of bored, kind of sad, he looks up and he falls in love with Cora from afar. And he's like, oh, you know, I think I wanna, I think I wanna ask her to marry me. And he goes to his brother Zeus, he's like, I'm in love with Cora. Do you think we could get married? And Zeus is like, that's the best idea. And they do their secret bro handshake and they seal the deal. But like, nobody tells Cora and nobody tells her mother. So poor Cora is just picking flowers one day, like doodly doo, hurricane comes up, literally blows her friends away. And then while she's on the ground, like what happened? Like suddenly these four dark horses and a mysterious rider pop out of nowhere as if they've been invisible, which of course they had been. And this rider swoops down and he picks her up and she screams to her mother, mother! And he goes thundering across the field and he throws up his mighty bident. Have you guys ever heard of bident? Yeah. Like a trident is like three, a bident is like two. Isn't that cool? And dent means teeth, like dentist. I think that's neat. He throws his bident, <laughs> hits the ground. <laughs> Huge hole opens up. Cora screaming, ah, crazy man, drive me towards a hole in the ground. Without even slowing down, whoosh, right off the edge. Four horses, two gods, they fall. They fall for 24 hours straight. Wow. The entire time, Cora's screaming. The entire time, Hades isn't talking to her because he's not talked to girls yet. And finally, after a full day, they land at the bottom, boom. She just slumps over. She's like, well, I don't know what's going on. He's throwing all the stuff on the floor because he's a pig. He's not an evil god, but he has to learn a lot about how to treat other people, and that's kind of what this story's about. All right, Poseidon. This was the hardest book I ever wrote. It's really hard. So everybody knows Poseidon, right? Yeah. He's like in a million Greek myths. He's never quite the hero. He's just always in them. And this is the way I like to describe Poseidon. Who's ever had the experience you go to the beach, and you go out into the water about up to here, and you face out to sea, and then a wave comes, and you jump up. Yeah. And you float down, right? So nice. You jump up, and you float down. And you turn to your friend, and you go, oh, isn't this so nice? Your friend's like, oh, that's so, boom! A wave knocks you over? Like, that's the whole Poseidon experience. He goes from like zero to crazy in two seconds. So, this is gonna be a little embarrassing. I had to work a long time to get Poseidon just right, and finally I wrote Poseidon from his point of view. If you read this book, it's like, it's Poseidon narrates it. So I'm going to act like Poseidon right now. So if you guys could just look at me and pretend I'm like nine foot tall and have huge muscles and long seaweed hair, and I'm like green and wearing a diaper. <laughs> Can you guys, or you know, cause that's really disturbing, just look at the pictures. <laughs> All right, <clears throat> let me get into character. <laughs> Takes me a second. <clears throat> I am Poseidon, lord of the sea, and I sink down through the cool liquid blue past all these fish that George totally copied out of Finding Nemo. <laughs> and here I am at the bottom of the ocean, and all is cool and calm. Oh, and look here in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> it's a trident. My uncles, the Cyclopes, gave it to me. And with it, I create whirlpools. And the waves slide from my dark hair. And my voice thunders from the deep. And he raises up the trident. And then I turn the page. Brings it down. Boom! The ocean floor is shattered. There's just this huge rift. Up on the surface world, this cliff's collapsing. This guy, he's in this house. He's like, I hate you, Poseidon. And then like... This guy, he was out fishing for tuna, and the water's gone. Oh, hey, where'd the ocean go? Oh, there it is. It's a tsunami made of horses. And here's a Manoan outpost of civilization. Blam, it's gone. 
And the dude who like one second ago was like, I am one with the universe, is now like, I am Poseidon, sinker of storms, sinker of ships, bat out before me in despair! <laughs> Have you guys ever heard of Odysseus? That's Odysseus. <laughs> He's like, I, I'm feeling seasick. <laughs> Whoa! This was my favorite book to draw. If you guys remember, I basically, I, I like to draw monsters. Got to draw a lot of monsters. I like to draw muscle men, a lot of muscle men, but I also like to draw pretty ladies. This book is nothing but pretty ladies. Right here is Aphrodite. My version for Aphrodite, I basically, have you guys ever seen Modern Family? Yeah. It's Gloria from Modern Family mixed with Beyonce. Can you see it? Like Aphrodite, like like she's she was a goddess. I wasn't so sure, but like I, I kind of dig. I think she might be the most powerful Olympian. She has the power to make people fall in love, right? Like, look, Zeus normally sees a pretty lady. He's really excited. Now he's got his back turned to her. He's like, uh, no, because she could make him fall in love with anything she wants, right? She'd be like, hey Zeus, don't you love this rock? He's like, yes. And she could throw it off a cliff. And he's like, woo, you know. <laughs> So here's a little bit from Aphrodite. This is, um, we've seen this before. Kronos the Titan, slicing up on Uranus the sky. Light comes down, everywhere it touches it makes a gigante. But there was other stuff up in the sky too. There was something called Eros. Now Eros is the Greek name for Cupid, right? You know, the guy on Valentine's Day? But he, he's the second Eros. The first Eros was just this like power. It was literally the power of love. And it's not just love like makes you go like, ooh, power of love makes you want to like form like new life. It's like the power of life. It's really important. And it, it, it doesn't have, it's not a god, at least not yet. It's just this power that makes everything happen. It's up in the sky. It's cut loose. It falls down into the ocean and just makes bubbles. It's like a giant bubble bath. It does that for years. The world changes. The titans give birth to the sun and to the moon and to the next generation of titans. And then in time, they give birth to Zeus and the first generation of Olympians. And then Zeus gives birth to the second generation of Olympians. And then animals come out everywhere. And then I have another Finding Nemo reference because I love that movie. <laughs> that's actually, that's the moment right before Nemo's mom gets eaten. So like, why did I put that in there? It's like, what's wrong with me? There's like a barracuda right off screen. And then people come and they build these cities all over the world and they build temples to the gods. And then after thousands of years, that Eros, that power that's been there just making bubbles since the beginning of time, one day Eros decides to give itself a brain. And then it's not an it anymore, it's a she. And then she creates this perfect body for herself out of sea foam. This is Aphrodite. Aphrodite's name means born from sea foam. She's literally made of nothing but bubbles and like the power of love. I know, weird, right? And then, so then, off the island of Cyprus, this beautiful creature just comes out. Now remember, she's made of nothing but bubbles and love, right? So just to be near her, you fall in love with her. So these fish are like, woohoo, woohoo! They can't even take it. And she walks, she walks to the shore of Cyprus. And as she comes ashore, Zephyrus, the west wind, he blows her power all over the land and everyone everywhere starts feeling this. And the water that's running off her body, it's like, you're too, we can't bear to be apart from you. The water transforms itself into silk so it could just be with her. And when she puts her foot onto the bare rock, the rock's like, you're too good to step on us. And then it splurts into like all these wild flowers. And that's how the world meets Aphrodite. Hands up, who thought out there was going to be a naked lady when we turned that page? Anybody? I would never do that to you guys. <laughs> now check it out. Here's a study in contrast, right? Aphrodite standing atop a bed of wildflowers. Aries standing atop a pile of the dead. <laughs> they seem, these two seem like they're opposites, but these two love each other. He is actually, even though Ares is like, I mean, okay, if you read the Iliad, which is the story that Ares retells, they refer to Ares repeatedly as a psychopath and a maniac. And he is, he's a murderer. But he's also, strangely, he's the most handsome of the gods. So Aphrodite's like, that guy's hot. And they like really dig each other. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about Ares here. All right. I spoke about this before when we were talking a little bit beforehand. But, um... The Greeks have two gods of war, right? They have Athena 
and they have Ares. Now Athena is the goddess of strategy, of skill, of like, like martial skill. Like she's all about, she's like the ninja of Mount Olympus, right? She's got all these like techniques. These are Athenian soldiers. They're lined up, perfect formation, perfect skill. Everyone is doing exactly as they need to do. You turn the page and you can see they're like this unstoppable phalanx of troops, right? Like look at that. This one guy right here. See the sweat coming off him? It's scary, right? That's scary to fight. He's beginning to get a little scared. When you get scared, you get sloppy. People start fidgeting. People start breaking formation. They start stepping back and forth. And then that little bit, when people start to lose it, that's when Ares takes the field. <laughs> So Harry, Ares is kind of like the Incredible Hulk, but with like swords and stuff. So in the Iliad, they describe him. He's so powerful that his armor shoots off energy like, like fire. So he's like on flame. His, his chariot is being ridden, is being driven by Eris, the goddess of discord. And he's flanked by his sons Deimos and Phobos, fear and panic. And they're just like, and look at this. He's literally just riding his chariot over soldiers. He is a monster. He just deals death, and that's what he exists for. He doesn't care what side he fights on. In the Trojan War, he fought for the Trojans, but sometimes he killed Trojans, sometimes he killed Greeks. He literally is like a lawnmower, and soldiers are like grass. Whoever's in front of him, he'll just cut them down. They have some cool descriptions. They describe that when he screams, like in this panel, he sounds like 9,000 or 10,000 men screaming at once. Can you imagine that? This giant guy just going through the battlefield like, Bruh! but like times 9,000. <laughs> Check this out. This is literally one of only two times I've ever drawn Ares smiling. And it's because he's staring into the eyes of a group of people he's about to massacre. <laughs> and there he is again. We return to like the cover image. He's sitting there atop a pile of the dead, holding out his weapons, his arms soaked in gore, dripping blood. He doesn't bleed, that's not his blood. And that's Ares. <laughs> I don't even think he's smiling. That one, he's just going, ah! All right. Hey, it's me. <laughs> this is me with, uh, I was trying to grow a beard, which wasn't a good idea, and I have short haircut. What am I doing in this picture, guys? Research. Wait, who said it? Research. Research. This is me. This was me when I was working on Zeus. First step I do whenever I'm working on these books is I research. And by research, I read every single myth I could find about the god in question. This is me reading about Zeus. Read, 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 until my head is like that first picture I showed you. And I stop right before my head explodes. But I'm just about to explode. I, my, it's so full of ideas, I can't even take it. Then I take my sketchbook. This is really light, but it's really quick drawings. I just draw what I call key scenes. Just getting down ideas, pictures. This is a picture of Kronos being like, I won! This is Kronos scooping up Zeus. I'm not worried how they fit together as a story yet. I'm just getting down rough ideas. You can also see there's a little bit of writing in there, here and there. After I fill up a sketchbook or two like that, I start drawing thumbnails. Have you guys ever heard of a thumbnail? It's like a little tiny, yeah, it's like maybe two inches of sketch of what the actual page will look like. And there's that, pe there's that pose of Kronos, like, I won. And there's the pose of Kronos grabbing Zeus. I assemble those things into a page. And it's got to be able to tell a story. It's got to look good as drawings. It's got to look good as a composition. This is hard. This takes me the longest of anything I do. And you'll also notice I'm writing here at the same time. There's some people who could do comics where they write the whole script and then they draw it. And there's people who could probably draw a whole comic and then write it. But I can't do that. I have to do it step by step by step, little by little, over and over. So after I do this, which sometimes takes me months, I do the dummy. And you guys have seen some of the dummy already, right? The dummy's just cleaned up so people can look at it and make sense because really, it's super hard to tell what's going on there. But here's the dummy, everything's much clearer. No words here because I've actually taken the words and I've typed them up in a Word document. This is separate. I send this to my editor who corrects all my grammar and spelling mistakes and such. And then I start doing finishes. Now. I showed you guys earlier the pencil sketch from Zeus. I draw a really loose pencil sketch. I also do this twice as big as the books. Because if you draw everything big and shrink it down, it looks better. Like all your mistakes shrink away and everything looks really tight. And then, have you ever seen in old timey movies where people actually take pens and dip them in ink? Like I actually draw that way. So all these lines are done with an old drip pen and then like the big black areas I actually color them with a paintbrush. And then I take that, I scan it into my computer in my studio in Brooklyn. Look at all that stuff on the wall. And then, in my computer, 
I color it, I add in panel borders. If there's word balloons, I add in those. And all this stuff, and after this is done, I send it off to my publisher, and about nine months later, I get the book back and I take a nap. <laughs> That's the worst photo, right? <laughs> um, here's a couple things from my sketchbook, then we're gonna wrap this up and I'll take some questions. Sound good? All right, so. This is a drawing of Ares I did a long time ago. I mentioned that in the Iliad, he's often described as dripping in other people's blood. This is Ares dripping in other people's blood. I call it blood dripping Ares. Good name, right? I call this one, Athena needs to learn how to iron her skirt. <laughs> this is a drawing of Hera I did. This is my favorite drawing of Hera. Hera, as I mentioned, is my favorite goddess. Her sacred bird is the peacock. So I actually gave her a head that looks kind of like a peacock. She has the long neck and the weird antenna thing in the back. This is a drawing of Hermes. This is the only time I've ever drawn Hermes' eyes. Hermes is the most busy Olympian. He's the god of like about 20 million things, but he's the god of liars. And of course, like the way to tell if somebody's lying is you look into their eyes, right? So if you look at my books, Air, um, Hermes always has his helmet pulled down low, so you can't see his eyes. And it won't be until book 10, which will be Hermes' book, that you finally see what color his eyes are. But in the meantime, there's a drawing of him. Speaking of eyes, there's a Cyclops. These are the original three Cyclopes as they appear in Zeus. This is based on a drawing I did with my father when I was six years old. We had a big piece of paper. We drew these four monsters on it. And one of them was this big googly-eyed like Cyclops type creature who I kept drawing over and over and over again for years. And he changed a bit. He used to have lobster claws. Now he's got those weird long fingers. When he was in high school, like when I was in high school, he had like electric plugs for hands because I was weird. He used to be thinner. Now he's gotten a bit bulkier. But I've been drawing the same guy now for like 30 years. So. He's finally an Olympians. Speaking of Cyclopses, or Cyclopes, this is a different type. This is Polyphemus, the son of Poseidon. This guy eats people, so I had to give him a mouth. And like, this guy's in trouble, right here. Here's a sketch of the Minotaur. Minotaur eats people. Some sketches of the Gigantes. Gigantes eat people. <laughs> Medusa! This is my super gross version of Medusa. Basically, I figure if Medusa was real, nobody would know what she looks like, because if you saw her, you'd be dead, right? So in my book, when people are talking about Medusa, this is what she looks like. Medusa's in the Athena book. But the one time you actually see her really, like her face right before her head gets cut off, she looks like that. She's not going to win a beauty contest, but she's not as gross as that one, right? Oh. <laughs> and then there's a picture of Zeus I did. This was my favorite drawing of Zeus, where I got him just right. Where he's young and handsome and ferocious looking. And like, I'm like, that's, that's going to be my Zeus's face. And then there's my contact info. So if you guys want to find out more about me online. And just thank you guys so much. That was my presentation. You, you want to be the one who chooses? No, Since, I okay, so who's got questions? Let's get these gentlemen right up here. Which character is your favorite? Which character is my favorite? I'd like to answer that in a four part response, if I may. My favorite god is Hermes. My favorite goddess is Hera. My favorite hero is Heracles. So it's like her, her, her. And then my favorite monster is Typhon. Typhon hasn't appeared yet. How about that gentleman right there? Yeah. Um, how did you decide to make these books? How did I decide to make these books was the question. Um, man, it's, you know, it's funny. You think I talked about how I was so into these stories since I was a little kid. It wasn't actually until I was hanging out with my editor. And one day he was telling me a story about a guy we both knew at a party. And this is a guy that was kind of a, like a loud dude. And he was at the party, like basically yelling at somebody. And he was drooling and he yelled. <laughs> and my editor's like, he looked like Cerberus. And I was like, wow, that's a really cool Greek myth. And I said something weird to him back about like a cyclops. And he's like, I don't know you like Greek myths. I'm like, I love Greek myths. And he looks at me and I look at him and he reaches off his bookshelf and he pulls a book, which is the same size as the Olympians would be. He goes, what if you do a comic this big telling Greek myths? And I'm like, oh. I run home and like in two weeks I write Zeus and I come back I'm like all right here's Zeus and there's gonna be 11 more let's do it and like we had some meetings and that was it so it was actually 
I, it makes the most sense in the world for me to do this. It wasn't until my editor actually made fun of somebody by calling them Cerberus that I had the idea. Um, what, how about in, right back there? The one, that one, all the way in the end. Oh, no, no, no. Right to your... <laughs> I think you're going to choose from now on. How long did it make, how long did it take you to make all the series? Uh, all of them together? I started doing these books, I think, in 2009 or 2008. And so I've got eight of them done now. Because you've seen seven, and Apollo's all done. That's book eight. That one's not out yet, though. And I'm working on Artemis now. It normally takes me between six months and... Six months was how long like Zeus took me and like Aphrodite, those are my two quickest. And then like Poseidon, which took me a really long time, that took me like 14 months. So yeah, it was a rough one. Which book was your favorite? Which book was your favorite? Oh, which book is my favorite of mine? Um, it, there's two answers to that. One way, it's kind of the one I've always just finished. That always feels really good. But the one I really love best, the one I always go back to, is Hera. That was the one I felt like I grew the most as a writer doing. And plus, uh, I really like Hera, and I felt it was a... I, I wanted to basically tell her story, so everyone's just not like, she's just the jealous wife of Zeus. There's so much more to her. And I felt like I did it. What was your first book ever published? <laughs> uh, the question was, what was my first book ever published? Um, hmm. I did some books under a name that's not my own. When I was in college, I drew some comics, for instance, that I'm not going to admit to. My first book I ever did that was a book book that got published, it was just the pictures. It was, um, you guys know Wizard of Oz, right? It was a sequel to The Wizard of Oz called The Glass Cat of Oz about this cat that's made of glass but it's alive that lives in Oz. That was my first book. I think it's still out there somewhere, but I only drew the pictures. I didn't write that one. <laughs> Who do you think is the coolest Greek god? Oh, man, that's a tough question. Who do I think is the coolest Greek god? I mean, it's got to be Hermes, right? Hermes is like, he's like the Bugs Bunny of the Greek gods. He's like the smartest guy, but he only uses his powers to cause trouble. So, like, yeah, I think it's him. <laughs> Who is the strongest god? Oh, that's a good question. Who is the strongest god? Depends on your source. But basically, the way I think about it, the original six Olympians, Zeus, Hades, Poseidon, Hera, Demeter, and Hestia, they're all kind of about the same level of power. There's a couple of myths where Zeus says, like, I'm as strong as all of you put together, but he's totally lying. <laughs> so it's like basically those six, and then like the next six are about maybe the same level of strength. Who's next? What are your other books going to be about? Okay, so the rest of the order of the series, I already mentioned that Apollo is the next one. And then after Apollo is Artemis. Book 10 is going to be Hermes. Book 11 is going to be Hephaestus. And then book 12 is going to start off with a little bit about Hestia, and it's going to end up with Dionysus. And that's going to be the end of the series. Then I'm going to take like a five-year nap after that one. <laughs> Where do you get all your ideas to write? Where do I get all my ideas to write? Well, well, I mean, the one answer, I read a lot of Greek mythology. That certainly helps. But I do other books, too. I bring my sketchbook with me everywhere I go. It's even here now. In case I have an idea, I can write it down really quickly. Um, I get my ideas from everything. You know like sometimes you're just like in the shower and you get a weird idea? Are you walking down the street? Or you just see somebody who looks funny or something and you just have an idea? I'm constantly writing idea, ideas like that. I have filled up, this is like I think sketchbook number 113 that looks like this. Like you go to my studio and it's just like there's an entire shelf along the whole building. Room, not building. And then like I just have tons of ideas there and sometimes I just look through them and just really cool ideas will come and sometimes they don't. Um, Phoebe is the go is the goddess of uh, youth. Um, yes. If if great if I'm just asking you personally, um, if gods can live forever, what's exact? Does she and um, what's exact? Uh, what's her her ex what's her really good point? Of <laughs> God, if she if gods can live forever, anyway. That's a good question, right? 
So if we're dealing with a group of immortal beings who never get old and never die anyway, what's the purpose of a goddess of youth? I think her purpose is not for the gods. Her purpose is for people. And think of it more like this. She was more like the goddess you would pray to to protect your children or when you were a child. But that's exactly why on Olympus she gets that, the kind of crummy role. Like, you know, like, you know, the Greek, I mean, the other gods, they could use Hermes. They, he's really useful. Or Athena, all those other ones. With her, they're not going to get old anyway. So, like, just service drinks. Why did you decide to write books? Man, the question, why did I decide to write books? Man, why not? What a cool job I have. <laughs> Basically, this is my day, right? I wake up every morning. I go inside. I just start drawing pictures. I write down stuff. I get to travel all around the country and just like go and speak to people and things. I have the coolest job in the world. It's, um, I wanted to do this since I was a little kid. I don't know how much I really chose. I was always, when I was really little, I'm like, I want to draw pictures and tell stories. And uh, doing books is the best way to do that. It's just like, it's an awesome job, guys. Who here would want to do maybe, like be an author? Hands up. Nice. Can I give you guys some quick advice? Get a sketchbook or a diary or something, write in it and draw in it every single day, even if it's only for like 15, 20 minutes. And if you draw, draw quickly. Don't spend hours drawing one picture. You guys are young. You're still, you're still learning. If you have a half hour to draw, instead of spending it drawing one picture, draw the same picture six times. Every sketch I showed you from my sketchbook, probably none of those were more than a three minute drawing. I start quick, quick, quick. And like, because then every time you draw, you learn something. If you draw quicker, you learn quicker. That's my big advice. Did you get most of your, idea, most of your drawings offline? Offline? Oh, gosh, no. If I were to get my drawings offline, that would mean I was plagiarizing somebody else. And there would be a big lawyer that would show up at my door and arrest me. No, no, these are all pictures I draw myself. I read a lot of stuff in order to inspire them. I like to read the old Greek references to see what they say the gods looked like. But yeah, I have to make up everything myself. All right, George, you choose the last one. Last one, guys. Make it count. Make it count. All right. Right back there. That was the one I was trying to send you back to. First row of the second tier. Yes, little. No, no, no. Right there next to you. Yes. Yeah. What god would you like to be if you could be a god? Man, I was hoping that would be the question. Okay. <laughs> I have a follow-up question. Do I only have their powers or do I have to do their duties as well? Only have the powers. Okay. If it's only their powers, Hermes. Man, like run around faster than the speed of light everywhere. Like so fast I could be in multiple places at once. That would be awesome. Also, he's the only god who could go to the underworld. So like he's the god of boundaries. He could go anywhere. Even Zeus can't go to the underworld. However... If I had to do his duties, I would not want to because he has to be that fast because he has like 8 million jobs. He's like, he works all the time. So if like, yeah, if I just could be that fast, yeah. Like my favorite Avengers, Quicksilver. I just like fast dudes. So like that would be like the coolest, the coolest power. Man, good questions, guys. Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> And now, you guys, let's give George O'Connor a big round of applause. Oh. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. I know that other people have questions. If you want, you can write to me on my website or on my Facebook or Twitter. I'll get back to you. It might take a couple days, but I always do. And uh, thank you guys so much. You guys were awesome. Yay. So, you guys. Thank you to CCTV for filming this for us today. And a big thanks to Porter Square Books, who, because of them and their grant, you're all going to get a book. So on your way out, there's a table full of books. Very calmly, someone is going to give one to each child, all right? So um, te <laughs> teachers. <laughs> You can take it from here. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for setting this up.